As we prepare to receive God's word as preached, let's turn for our scripture reading to Matthew chapter 16. And uh, we'll read verses 13 through 20 of Matthew chapter 16, pages 950 and 951 in your pew Bible. Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13 and reading through verse 20. We'll find our text. It will be a bit of a springboard for us today, looking at different texts to support the theme of being Christ's church. But first, the scripture reading, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Hear then the word of the Lord. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Our text, I tell you, verse 18, that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Thus the reading God's word, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Make your word in our lives by the work of your Holy Spirit, a double-edged sword, piercing the dividing of sunder, of joint and mare, revealing the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Lay all bear before your holy presence today in each of our lives. Use your word to fashion us into more perfect disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and a more perfect expression of his glorious body, the church, even here in New Haven, Vermont. And so it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Unlike... Some of you, and not all of you, probably, uh, I've spent my life in the church in various expressions of the church, raised Methodist Episcopal, which is, of course, the modern equivalent of the United Methodist Church, was converted in a Bible church that was more Baptistic than Presbyterian, but had a, a Presbyterian pastor originally who relented on infant baptism and took up adult baptism, but it was a doctrinally solid church in many ways, a place where I heard the gospel, the Bible taught verse by verse, and, and really came to know the Lord. And when I went to college, uh, went to fundamental Bible uh, Baptist type of churches. Uh, in those days, the Southern Baptist Church and the independent churches were kind of at each other in the South, and so I sided with the Bible-believing independent fundamentalist and found a nice home there, learned a lot, was baptized there as, a, as a, an adult believer, even though I was baptized earlier as an infant in the Methodist church. And in the course of going to the Christian college and taking Bible classes, of course, I became Reformed, became Calvinist. And the church that was nearest us that had reformed on the door was the Christian Reformed Church in Pinellas Park, Florida. And uh, there's where I became introduced to the three forms of unity, the Heidelberg Catechism, Belgian Confession, Canons of Dort. 
and the Dutch Reformed tradition. I had never heard of it before in my life. I don't even think I'd heard of John Calvin before in my life at, until that time. And so this was an entirely new uh, side rail for me to take. And I was on the main line rail, just Bible believing, born again, witnessing, living holy, uh, growing in grace and knowledge. And then I took this peculiar tack toward the Reformed faith. What is this? And then, of course, Reformed Seminary. Over the course of my life in the Reformed faith in the last 40 years, I have served the CRC, was one of the founding pastors of the URC. I was, uh, spent some time serving the PCA church and then came back to church planning in the URC and 40 years comes and goes. <laughs> I don't know, it seems like yesterday. But if I get to the end of this journey in ministry, I become more and more concerned about the church, realizing what it means to be the church and really embracing that, you know, because it's possible to take a side rail and adopt a heritage, a tradition, a noble tradition, a biblical tradition, a very right tradition, like the Reformed tradition. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's biblical because the substructure must be there to put the superstructure on. It can be very useful, this tradition, these creeds and confessions, the way we do church. But if the foundation, if the substructure is not biblical, and we are not following the apostolic church that Jesus laid out, if the things that Jesus commanded are not the pressing concerns for us as the church, then that disconnect shows up later on. Even our young people will say, well, I don't really want to just be part of a reformed club. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now that's really something. And so I think that it's always necessary to come back and realize that whatever superstructure you put on it, it must be built upon the foundation of what the Bible teaches the church really is and the priorities of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and let that superstructure serve that substructure. Let it fashion it and empower it and enable it and give it practical uh, ability and always allow that to be changed and reformed for something that might even be more faithful and enable us to be more faithful as the church is just being the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now before, I think when I was here, there were four questions that I put before you along the same theme that every church should ask themselves. The first is, who are we? We are, as the church, the body of Christ. We are that connected to him that everyone who is in Christ Jesus and engrafted into Christ is the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ here, a little part of it here in New Haven, Vermont. Just think of that. We are the flesh and blood of Christ here on this earth by the spirit connected to Christ and one another. And that will never change. That will always be the same. Now, what are we? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't just dwell in individuals. He dwells in us and he blesses and he can also be grieved by our disobedience. And why are we here? We are here to glorify God by rendering obedience to Christ as he commanded it. That's why we're here. To glorify God by rendering obedience to Christ as he commands it. He is the king and head of the church. He is, he is the king and head of the body. And he is commanding us. That's why I'm here preaching. That's why Reverend Not stands up here and preaches every week. Is because Christ has sent us down to preach his word to his body, the church which is a tremendous burden and privilege. And so I've said these things before, but that's to help us think biblically before we think about any type of Protestant tradition that we may think is biblical and believe is biblical, 
or any other kind of statements that must, we have, fine statements have been made about the church, the, the four characteristics of the apostolic church in Acts chapter 2, or the marks of the church in the Belgian Confession. Just think about being Christ's church, because Christ is about the business of building his church. It says that in our text, doesn't it? I will build my church, his church, his church, not our church, not the church of our tradition. It is Christ's church that we're building. We're not building a church for the United Reformed Churches in North America. Somebody will take great pride in us and say, look at that URC church up in New Haven. Look how they're doing. Wow, we've got a flagship church up there. That's misguided. Not planting churches in order to say, you know, I planted three churches. I planted five churches. Look at the great church planner. No, we're building Christ church of which we humbly, as a branch of the historic Protestant movement, surviving today, are informed by all of that tradition and all of those doctrinal statements. Why? So that we can build Christ church. And it must be done his way. It must be done his way. Uh, the model of building Christ church in Europe 400 years ago, 500 years ago, just may not work in America today. There may be ways that if we go back to scripture, we find the way that Christ wants is done that will force us to have to do things differently, think about things differently. And it's uncomfortable. I like what one person said after I preached on this year, years ago. He said, every time you come and preach on the church, I feel like there's work to be done. I said, yeah, that's good. That's good, because there is. Because the church can never rest on its laurels. On one hand, the church is commended by Christ for its faithfulness, and it's, it's critiqued by Christ for his faithfulness. You know, we think of the last words of Christ to his church being the Great Commission. No, the last word of Christ to his church are the seven letters in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation. If you've read those, they're pretty scary. Because the church over time can lose its way. The church can lose its first love. The church can become lukewarm. The church can become materialistic. The church can be, come rife with error. All those things are spoken of by the last letters of Christ to his churches in the book of Revelation. So we always have to, on one hand, take great comfort in who we are in Christ. Come tonight, you'll hear about that, being a child of God. And always be prodded into thinking biblically about what we are as a body and why we exist here. So I've just jotted down some things that might help us think about that under the theme of building Christ, of being Christ's church. Of course, doing it his way would mean that we reflect upon Matthew 28 and what he says in the Great Commission, beginning with verse 18. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, a very familiar passage used by missionaries and church planners as they come and try to get you to pray for and support their works, where it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Because the first thing then about being Christ's church and being Christ's church his way, without any reference necessarily to the faith of our fathers or the great traditions that we subscribe to and have much benefit for us and should, is that the first thing about being Christ's church is we must be laser focused upon making disciples. Now, a little theology here is covenant theology is merely a way of saying that the children of our congregation are disciples, young disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are raised with the covenant promise. 
who are raised with the, with the, the promise that the, uh, the God of the covenant, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is their God. And that our first task is always to see that successive generations raised in covenant families from generation to generation are turned into disciples in the process of living as part of the body of Christ, of observing, of learning, both when we're gathered and in our catechism classes and our Sunday school classes and other opportunities they have to hear the word of God, but especially at home where parents have the responsibility to see to it that little Johnny becomes a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, or little Mary becomes a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we typically call covenant children are merely those who are first and foremost pledged in the body of Christ to become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who follow Christ. Because that is what Christ tells us. Is that he never tells us that there are two different types of disciples in the body of Christ. There's just one type of disciple, those who are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and those who are taught to obey everything that Christ has commanded. So whether they come from the internal, multi-generational development of the church through successive years, or whether they come through the method that we may adopt to bring people into the body of Christ, it doesn't matter. Our goal is to make disciples because that is how Jesus says we are to be as the church. That is how he will use us to build his church. Always and inevitably laser focused on making disciples. And that never changes. That can't change because that's biblical. That is so basic to the teachings of Jesus about his church. That no theology or no, no nomenclature that develops out of that theology or no concepts that develop out of that theology should ever mute what Christ says we are to be about as the church, and that is making disciples. Are our children and our children's children lined up each day? Have they been taught to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Christ? Are they doing that? Are we doing that as a family? Is the congregation doing that as a corporate body? Are we truly enrolled in discipleship because that's what it means to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the church he's building. And he says it's very possible to have some other configuration or some other idea enter in and disrupt that or occlude that or set it aside. And yet, that's what Christ says we are to be about. He doesn't discriminate between those who, you know, are old or young. They're to be baptized. They're to be taught in following Jesus Christ to be his disciples. Secondly, if we're going to do things Christ's way in being his church, it is through taking the gospel to his yet-to-be-found sheep extensively, intensively, and repeatedly that we bear the fruit of making disciples as Jesus promised. If you look over in John chapter 10, in the great passage of Jesus, I've referred to this before too, but repetition is good. Jesus is talking about the fact that he is the great shepherd and he's speaking about his sheep. And then he goes on and he says uh, in this passage in verse 18, uh, verse 18 or 16, excuse me. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. One flock, one shepherd, other sheep. Other sheep that are not there present with Jesus and his disciples as he's teaching them. Sheep that will have yet to be reached, have yet to hear his voice, and we have the responsibility to be the voice of Christ to those sheep who have yet 
to hear his voice, who have yet to respond to the gospel and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, who have yet to hear the voice of the shepherd through the gospel. You know, the gospel is merely presenting the person and work of Christ to sinners with the promise of salvation uh, and the call to repentance for sin and faith in, upon, and into Jesus. The gospel is merely presenting Christ, who he is and what he has done to reconcile us to God with the promise of salvation, complete deliverance from the spiritual problems and moral problems that we inherited in Adam unto an entirely new existence in the body of Christ and in the kingdom of God by the mercy of God in Christ. Conditioned on repentance, I turn from my life of sin without Christ and faith in Christ, believing that he is what the, who the scriptures tell, tell us he is, and, and, and faith upon Jesus, trusting in him, and faith into Jesus, where from that point on, Jesus is everything. Jesus is Savior, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is my all. And so instead of Jesus coming back down to walk on this earth and compel us in his person to come and follow him, he gives us the gospel, which is the, the, the teachings about who Jesus is and what he's done for us, and promises that the power of the Holy Spirit will accompany the preaching of the gospel and compel people to believe upon Jesus and to take up their cross and follow him, even though they've never seen him. And they won't see him until he comes again. And this is the task of the church, is to make disciples using the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to reach those other sheep who have yet to hear Christ's voice, who will hear Christ's voice through the gospel. And we do that extensively to everyone, intensively to anyone, and repeatedly as need be as long as possible until they come to faith in Christ. And that is the task of disciple making. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And in Romans 1, 16, Paul writes these great words, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we make disciples, that's what Jesus says we do to be the church and to build the church. We do that through the gospel, which is scripture's teaching about the person and work of Christ for sinners. We bring that gospel to people extensively, intensively, and repeatedly. And we rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit to bless the giving of the gospel to people that by God's grace, they may come to new life in Christ under the influence of that gospel, whether they're young people who were born in the bosom of the church, or whether they are a 95 year old person who saunters in to our worship service and has never really gone to church much of their life. It doesn't matter, it's the same gospel, it's the same Holy Spirit. These are the, all the sheep that we are targeting. We have no idea who they are. That's why our reach has to be extensive. That's why our reach has to be intensive. And that repeatedly bringing the gospel to people until the Holy Spirit is pleased to enable them to hear Christ call them from heaven through that message. Well, that's a task, isn't it? Because that's what we're about. Of gathering Christ's disciples, which of course is what the church is, the body of Christ. It's a bunch of disciples gathered by the gospel, according to the mercy and power of God. It's a supernatural body that defies any kind of explanation other than it is of God. And it is held together by an omnipotent King of kings and Lord of lords, the King and head of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives the spirit to enable the body to grow, to reach others here and throughout the world where that gospel is preached. 
Therefore, the gospel always has to be preached, that the power of God may be realized, the disciples may be made. And this, of course, comes through the, corpus, the corporate witness of the body of Christ living in glad obedience to Jesus. No, I, I like the word gladness. I come by it hard. I'm not a glad guy by nature. Kind of a, you know, serious. I, I, the word glad, I, sometimes I don't even know what that means. I guess, you know, you experience that at some times in life when, when the blessings of life are just so obvious and overflowing that you're filled with gladness. You're happy to be alive. You're joyful. You, you're hopeful. But, of course, the world tempers that and makes gladness very difficult. But the body of Christ is called to be other than the world. It is called to be a glad witness for Jesus. A place where gladness can be found, where happiness can be found, where joy can be found, where hope can be found. Because we're not of this world. We're destined for eternity to be not just the body of Christ, but more the body of Christ than we are today, a glorified body of Christ. And we begin that celebration here because we know that is our inheritance there, and therefore we gladly rejoice even in difficult circumstances because we are not of this world. We're not beset ultimately by the problems of this world. So gladness is to be our moniker, happiness, joy, hope, and that sets us apart. How can they be glad in the middle of a pandemic? How can they be glad in the middle of an economic downturn? Because we know who we are and we know where we're going. And we know who the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. He covers the valleys in the lilies. He knows the hair that falls in the sink on Sunday morning. When you're just brushing your hair and you look down and you go, oh, it's not long, I'll be a billiard ball up there. He knows it all, why? Because he's fashioned it all, his plan, his purpose is absolutely perfect. His wisdom is inscrutable. He only lets us in on part of that, the most important part. His mercy, his grace, his love, his unbreakable bond to us in Christ, saying, I am now yours and forever yours, and you'll forever be mine, and someday you will taste glory, and you will forget all about the bitterness and difficulties of earth. For there is a glory coming for every child of God and the body of Christ, that makes the sufferings of this present world not even comparable. And so it is that type of corporate witness that we present to the world, an otherworldly witness. How can those people be happy? Now, when they look in the windows of our lives individually in our congregation, they go, how in the world can those people be rejoicing? How come they're not, you know, ready to jump off a bridge because they lost their life saving? How come they're not ready to end it all because, oh, the world has come to an end? Well, because we're not of this world, ultimately. We're in this world. But we just have a different source of gladness, which is knowing how we stand with God by the mercy of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that as breaks down not only to that witness, but to the personal witness, where we touch the lives of others for the purpose of perhaps drawing them into a discipleship relationship with Jesus. Remember what Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria and to the other ends of the earth. And it's through the personal witness of churches and families and individuals loving their neighbors as they love themselves, where we are fulfilling the law of love. Galatians 5, 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And this is basically the witness that we are to give to everyone insofar as it's within our capacity to do so. 
to love everyone as we love ourselves. I'm reminded by what Reverend Murphy told me years ago about church planning in New York City. He said, Steve, people follow love. People follow love. Love, well, you can't resist it. When someone loves you, you're drawn to them. And so it is that Christ commanded us to love everyone, that they may be drawn to us, that we may have opportunity at some point to point them to the Savior or to a place where they can come to know him so they can too begin to walk with Christ. And so it is that the goal of discipleship is to be used of Christ to create followers of Christ. And basically the church is just a bunch of people who have been called in to following Christ 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We come together for certain things for worship. We come together as followers of Christ, having followed Christ 24 hours a day, seven days a week otherwise. And we come here to worship the king and head of the church as part of his body, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, as followers of Christ. And then we go out and we strive to follow Christ every other moment of every other day. And so as we gather more followers, so the body of Christ is built up and we're doing it Christ's way. We're making disciples. And when the disciples are gathered into his body, as members of his body, they begin to live immediately under the authority of Christ and learn to live out the reconciled oneness to which we are called as all are to live out obedience to Christ according to the word of God. So we have a great task before us here to be the church. And it's more than just saying, look, I received this tradition from my forefathers 400 years ago. They gave us a great church order. They gave us the three forms of unity. They gave us a way of doing church. Okay, and so through successive generations, we have kept that tradition pure. We've even fought the fight of faith in order to purify that so it doesn't become entangled with any type of error. Great. To what end? As a means unto itself, or so that we may go back to the foundation of what Jesus says we are about as a church and get to the business of and always stay laser focused on making disciples. Being the church and building the church Christ's way by making disciples, disciples within, disciples without, as God gives us opportunity, as he gives us the strength, as he gives us the ability. So that is what we are about. That is how Christ's church is built up, multi-generationally from within, as our young people Deny, deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Christ as they believe in Christ, as they believe upon Christ, as they believe into Christ. But never just to be a member of an organization called the church, but to be members of the church, an organized church, biblically organized church, where everyone is committed to being a follower a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I offer this to you after all these years of ministry in the church as going back and kind of thinking through what did we do right? What did we do wrong? Where was our focus? Is it enough just to perpetuate an excellent Protestant tradition? Oh yes, it's moral and it makes us presentable citizens it gives us religious rituals. It certainly gives us something to do on Sundays. But is that really the goal? Or was the goal always that when children and young people would profess their faith in Christ, that they were professing their faith in the Christ of Scripture? They were trusting in that Christ for the salvation, and they were professing their faith into that Christ from that point on. To say, from this point on in my life, I self-consciously deny myself. I self-consciously take up my cross. I self-consciously follow Christ 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because he is the king and head of the church, of which I am a member of his body. 
and he is the judge of all the earth before whom I must stand someday. So we have to multitask this, and we make sure that we never forget to go back to the foundations of what it means to be the church and how Christ wants his church built, simply making disciples. May God give us grace to hear and understand these words. Let us pray. Father, this is nothing new, but soon forgotten. Perhaps over a Sunday meal. We sit and have a good time, family, friends. And we forget about the hard days of work in this past six days and the challenges before us tomorrow. We relax a bit and just say, yeah, it was good to be with God's people. And soon have forgotten that our task is to be a disciple-making organism as a living appendage of Christ, his body. Parents may forget that the purpose of catechism is to make disciples of covenant children who have the promise of Christ, who is their savior and Lord. The question is, will they self-consciously come to a place in their life where they deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Christ? Are they seeing that type of Christianity in the home, in the church, among the officers of the church? Or do we just do the church thing? It's so easy to lose sight of this, somehow to let it slide, settle for something much more comfortable, less challenging. We pray, Heavenly Father, though, that you will remind us of these foundational truths and what we are about as the body of Christ here in New Haven, that we may always be doing it Jesus' way, committed to making disciples both here, throughout the state of Vermont, up here in the Northeast region, throughout our nation, and yes, throughout our world, disciple-making bodies of Christ who just happen to be reformed, who just happen to have an excellent heritage, a good handle for doing this. So may we see this as our task. And, and when we forget it, may you remind us of it, that that is what we are about here until Jesus comes. And that through the precious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, endowed with power from on high. Bless us in the hearing of this word, we pray for Jesus' sake, amen. Our song is number 405.